My name is Nikolai and I'm from Rogue Wave uh, Software and uh, now we're part of Perforce, so we are even part of the bigger tools company and uh, before that we were a separate company also, Total V Technology. If, if probably don't, you, don't, you don't remember this one, but previously there was uh, another company and I will talk about debuggers. Um, so let me go to agenda, I have a lot of stuff to cover and first let me start by saying that uh, we are only doing debuggers and uh, we usually call it the debugger basically total view but it contains so many different features and different debugging techniques so now uh, I will be talking about uh, overview and different debugging like MPI debugging, reverse debugging, memory debugging so uh, we support GPU debugging and Python, C++ uh, debugging. Uh, we only specialize in debuggers, so that's why I guess I can spend a little more time just to talk why, what is debugging and why you need total view basically. So let's first talk about what is debugging and why do you need total view, or why do you need good debugger, why not just use printf basically like previous speaker said. So first of all, what is a debugging? So debugging the process of finding uh, and resolving defects. And uh, the first uh, type of problems that you need to solve is algorithm correctness. So if you have your algorithm, you need to test it, whether you have any bugs in the code. And this is probably uh, the first step. The next one is data correctness. And these two usually goes together. So your data may be imported wrong or it may be processed wrong and like uh, I like the example about integer conversion to float. So this is data correctness. And that was for a long time only two types of the problems. But recently you have also scaling and porting problems when you try to scale and you have more problems that you never saw before. The same if you recompile your code with different compiler move from your BGQ, for example, to Cray and you see another problems. So there is a lot of different uh, ways to introduce a bug in your program. So that's why I think we are in business. So just, I mean, we are commercial debuggers because everyone can use GDB. So like people say an open source free, but if you really want to go deeper, then you probably need to use some commercial one. So in this visualization, I try to see, uh, try to show what a real debugger can actually allow you to do. And the first one is interactive debugging. So this is probably the biggest uh, time you spend doing interactive. So what I mean by that, so everyone can put a print statement and this is called inspection. And the simplest debugging is basically you stop your program and then you analyze your data, your variables, you analyze how your program behave, but you're in basically a passenger seat. You just see what's going on in the program. But the next step will be you actually drive your program. So you can modify your data while you're running the program. You can change the execution order. You can execute the same code multiple times with different data and that all without even going out of execution. So you can start your MPI job and you can just go run it multiple times. So you're driving basically. And the way how debugger do that is basically attached to all your MPI or simple job and just control it. Next one is remote debugging. Uh, this is pretty obvious, especially for this uh, for you guys that you're doing a lot of MPI, I assume. So this is all remote debugging. So you attach to one AP run, for example, on your front node, and then you go to a lot of different compute nodes and do remote debugging. Uh, but also you can do more complicated stuff. So you can connect to any remote computer and just seamlessly do debugging there. And this is what is remote debugging. And we have a customer cases, which is basically they don't even know what computers they need to connect and debug. This is for example, cloud, Google cloud or Google data center. They start on one machine and then they get allocation automatically somewhere in Australia when the machines are free now. And they go and you can actually go and do debugging there. This is basically 
limitless possibility to do debugging and totally allow you to automatically attach to any program on any machine like anywhere if you have connection SSH connection RSH connection or even I think port connection serial one uh, post-mortem debugging uh, this is also very important when you don't have ability to do interactive or you only all you have is a core dump and the uh, debugger allow you to load this core and analyze what happens and going a little further we also have some unique capability uh, to do reverse debugging so you I will talk about more about reverse debugging so you load your program and then kind of debugging backwards so you can debug in two directions uh, memory debugging I think it's it was a new concept probably I don't know five ten years ago but now it's kind of mainstream uh, if most bugs that you try to solve in high level is basically memory bugs so the debugger allow you to find memory management problems like totally leaks corruptions uh, uh, electric fans and overrides. so this is memory debugging and I will talk about this one you can also compare results between executions how your memory change if you modify your code and batch debugging uh, like TV script uh, allow you to submit your job in batch mode it's it's kind of offload as the same concept so you can you can generate your results and then analyze them after your program run or you can also do uh, TV script uh, allows you to set up different points of your execution and at a particular point of execution you can basically print out all your variables and see if there are any changes and the latest uh, I think uh, latest uh, new stuff in this area is uh, CI environment so continuous integration so you always generate a new code and you want to make sure you don't introduce any bugs if your product is released like each day you want to make sure there is no new bugs and you can run debugger automatically behind the scene while you can even include it in your release pro uh, process and then run it to make sure there's no bugs there and I don't have time to talk about total is only dynamic debugger but we also have static code analyzer uh, which is clockworks uh, which only do static analysis and you can include it and now since we are also part of Perforce, we have another code analyzer which is kind of competing one and so we have two code analyzers in our portfolio but uh, what I'm talking about page debugging it's with total view and it's all included in in total view package that you have so now let's me let me talk more about debugger itself uh, so this is basically some small small history we are in active development for 30 years and uh, we are basically the first MPI debugger uh, and then we grow in all directions high end low end and since it's active development there is a lot of uh, features uh, was developed like thread specific breakpoints were first who developed that and uh, we support CC++ and Fortran on Linux uh, Unix and Macintosh and we also debu support debugging mix C++ and Python and Python basically I'll show you a demo how we do that uh, and since we support MacBooks and we installed on bigger supercomputers basically what our I think goal and our strategy is to to support everything uh, on anything basically so we only don't support Windows so this is a disclaimer <laughs> <laughs> maybe this will change with Perfort but I don't know right now yeah no Windows but if you go to any operating system basically any language any combination of language you can basically use total with that combination so all that is predictable development schedule and ironically less time spent on debugging so all we try to do is reduce your load on debugging no one wants debugging I guess so everyone wants to just run your code everyone is genius no problems so what we try to do we try to make your life easier so you start debugger you find your bugs and go to profiling and then run your application 
And also why I'm emphasizing predictable development schedule, this is also basically very important right now. I don't know how many people heard about Agile or... Okay, good. So you know a lot of, basically everyone is moving to Agile now and you need predictable development schedule. You know your release will be in like three months and we have released each three months basically sharp for like a number of years. And you want to basically allocate particular amount of time to fixing bugs. And having a good tools and uh, since I guess a lot of you just go to this area and like in the beginning I would say like having good tools is very important. Either it's Total U or I guess DDT, uh, it will help you save time. So let me let, let go next uh, since head on so I will be probably spend more time also talking about different features. Uh, user interface and uh, since we are already 30 years in development we have mature interface, uh, which some people call it old, but we call it classic. <laughs> uh, and it's still very good. So basically, uh, it's, it's our gold standard and it have all features and it's better tested for especially high, high scale MPI jobs. Or also have assembler support and different support for replay display client. And the nice thing you can switch between different interfaces on any one of them. You can switch from basically a classic to a new next generation interface, or you can start it from common line. Uh, let me stop for a second. How many of you actually know about Total? How many never heard about Total? Okay, basically half and half, so good. So I, I think our basically advice, if you, if you use Total before and like Total View, you can use any version. You can continue using classic, it will support it for a long time because we have a lot of customers who will never switch, so we don't want to lose them. Uh, but if you're a new one and you want to, you can try both of them, which one you like better. And for new interface, we even have dark scheme for anyone who want to go to dark side, <laughs> which I actually hate, but yeah, there's a lot of people actually like it. Okay, so new interface is a modern dockable, dockable interface based on Qt and uh, it's our architecture to grow, so we'll grow two interfaces. I uh, can start it from, from new UI, from command line, like totally dash new UI. There's some gaps, so I basically probably can tell that we are still in development of array slicing, visualization of data, and we didn't test on high scale support, so I guess can tell you as it's probably it's not working because we didn't test it. Uh, but high scale, I mean basically more than 1,000 of processes. So if you're less than it, it's probably okay. Okay, so let me, let me show some basic feature for those who never use it. So now uh, there is four different mode of operation right now. There will be five in the next release. So you can start a new program, new parallel program uh, running, attached to a running program, which is basically can be remote and local and use a core and basically use a attached to core file. So we have a program session manager. So you just start a new session. It will ask you different questions, whether to set up arguments, enable reverse debugging, enable memory uh, debugging, and enable CUDA memory checking if you're debugging CUDA. Uh, then you can set up environment uh, and uh, IO input output so you can specify which files you want and nice thing you can all save that next time you just start it so you don't need to basically do it each time. Uh, if you're uh, trying to attach and this is what is I was talking about remote debugging you can select different hosts that you want to attach you can select program and that just start a session you can also enable reverse debugging there. Uh, Start a core file, you can just type in file name and type, usually it's a core, but sometimes it's course dot some number and then hit start session. Uh, once your session starts, uh, you will see uh, interface. So interface, both classic and you basically have two concepts. Uh, first part is a root window which is control basically window that all your processes and all your threads 
uh, shown there, aggregated, and you can see where basically your program occur, and you can switch between them here. You can sort and basically. So this is your like command level, but each one also have a process window. In this process window, uh, we provide a detailed state on one thread and one process. So there's a stack trace toolbar for different uh, controls and source pane where your all data happens. And this is classic classic interface, and I will show you example with new one. Uh, and uh, step in command, and while, while I'm spending time here, because you can basically have a focus. If you control one thread, you can, you can control one process, and you can control the whole group. You can select custom group and do it. And we, it basically said step means you go to the next instruction, basically, to the next source, and next go over. Uh, what is also, in, I think uh, quite unique to total view is you can select a line without even setting a breakpoint and just run to this line. So you don't basically need to set a breakpoint. And while I'm here, uh, I will a little explain more what I mean by control of your application. So you can, for example, set, you basically can stop here and then you can change the value and then set a, set a jump again to line 10 and rerun the code again. See how your program will execute with different variables. So you're, you're not basically just in, investigate, you can control your application. As far as action points, uh, we have different uh, action points. Breakpoint, everyone knows, you set a breakpoint, program stops. Barrier points, you use an MPI job and you can specify how many processes and what processes needs to be stopped. Conditional breakpoint, you can set up a condition once your application hits the breakpoint. And we also call it evaluation point, basically the same thing. And watch point, watch point you look at for memory. So conditional breakpoint, you can set expression and you can evaluate and stop your execution or you can don't stop, you can just change your data. And if you want to change data in your code without recompiling, this is a great tool. And this is my favorite feature, so I'll even spend two time, two slides here. This is more complicated. So as you can see, I write a for loop inside the breakpoint. I can call function and I can even put printf statement. So, and then I want to test my code. So I want to substitute lines 12, to 17. So I just type my new code and said go to line 17 when I finished executing my breakpoint in line 12. So this is page on the line. I don't need to recompile, I don't need to get another allocation, which can be time consuming. So I just recompile, I test my change, and then if I'm satisfied, I just go ahead. Another interesting idea here, you can you can attach to a running program. So your program is running for one hour and you don't have no clue what's going on, why it didn't finish. So you can attach to this program, stop it and see where it's going and then add printf statement here, for example, or evaluate and see data. And, and then you can basically let it run again and print out data, stop it again, deattach, let it run. So at, at any point you can attach to a running application, investigate what's going on, detach, let it run. Or you, you can even fix it. You can attach to program, change data, and then let it run with corrected data. Uh, there is little limitation, again you can use C++ constructor, but I think for MPI even C++ seems very advanced. So a lot of people use Fortran and C, so it's basically nice. Okay, uh, so next one, watch points. I don't know why it's. So watch points is basically different type of action point. It's not a breakpoint because breakpoint you put on the source line, watch point you put on the memory. So you watch memory. And when context of memory change, watch point is triggered and we stop the program. Uh, you can also set conditional and conditional breakpoints. So you can check. Check, check whether you want to stop or not. 
On some architecture, use hardware watch point, but it doesn't matter. This means performance can be different for different watch points. So this is basic concept, and I, I don't have a lot of time about C++ and data debugging, so I'll just go quickly. Uh, so we support uh, latest C++ 11 and 14 features, uh, like lambdas, transformation for smart points, and we also transform many of C++ and STL containers, like arrays, vectors, tuples, map, set. So what does it mean? Instead of just showing like the com complicated data's STL structure, uh, we'll transform it automatically. For example, this is an example of map and show value and key, basically key in a readable form. So transformations, it's uh, basically a big part of total use. So we can transform data in readable form and, and show you. Uh, this the same also uh, for arrays, we can slice array, we can filter array and show different values. So if you're not sure what values are right, you can also show range of values. And uh, if, you, if you want, you can show array statistics. You can see array statistics. So it will show you all your array data, so which is important for science. So you want to see how your array behaves. Uh, and, and also you can visualize array. So we have visualizer built in in total U, which two, two dimensional, three dimensional vis visualizers. And we also have uh, built in command dollar visualize, uh, which allow you to automatically visualize as program run. A dollar means that you need to pay for it. So it's, our own. it's not free, <laughs> but it's included. And it's basically a rule. If you have dollar in front of name in total view, it's, it's internal total view add-on value, which means something. It's all in documentation, so you can look up. For example, dollar stop means stop your execution. <coughs> so it's, it's, it's a variable inside total view. Okay, and another one probably I want to mention dive and all. Uh, which is very important for structure transformation. If you have a structure of different members and you're only interested in one member, you can select this value and hit dive in all and transform array of structures to simple array. And once you transform it, you can do whatever you want with array, slicing, visualization, or filtering of this array. Uh, and if you go to MPI, you can see across different platforms, view across. So you can select and see across platform and threads. And then you can also, basically it's the same transformation. You can transform everything, all your data array, and then you can do everything you want to with array, like visualization and, and that. So everything I talked about before is, is uh, for serial programming, but it's all easily extended to multi multi-process and multi-threaded. So now I'll talk about specifically about what is specific for multi-threaded multi-process. Uh, I didn't mention, but there is a attach a parallel program session. And in this uh, session wizard, you can select MPI from your parallel system and you can, it's, it's all in text base. So you can add your own uh, a parallel system and, and then set up task notes, save them if you want, and then just start and attach to running program. Uh, and again, I, as I said before, you can control group and you can select select particular group on process and move to one process or move the whole group to the next, uh, next line of the code. So this is very straightforward. Uh, also unique from um, MPI is message queue graph. And this is something that compiler produce. They produce uh, data in libraries that we can process. And if compiler support it and a lot of basically MPI compiler support, it can show you the snapshot of all your communication at any time. So you can stop your application and show all messages, which is pending messages, received, sent, unexpected. You can. You can inspect uh, buffers and see what's inside these messages. Uh, and if you want to find a deadlock, we have automatic cycle detection facility, which allows you to detect multiple deadlocks 
also allow you to find performance syncs to see what what rank basically is waiting for communication and spend most of the time waiting. So again, it's not a profiling can basically say in how much time, but it's it's like a snapshot. You can attach to your running application or you can stop it and see exactly what's going on. And uh, difference with profiling, this is instant and you can stop and see your variables. So you can see not only why process is spending most of your time in rank zero, but actually stop rank zero and see where it stop your time and what data, which is most important, is, is there. Okay, uh, so first good, Any, everyone okay? So now let's talk about a very interesting idea about reverse debugging. How many of you know about reverse debugging? Okay, one, two, great. So this is new of you and so I think uh, reverse debugging, and we call it also replay engine, is the right way to debug. So why that? Because for each action, for example, step forward over function, we have counter action, step backwards. And step forward, we have unstep. So out, advance forward, you can advance out of the function just before the call. Run to and back to. So each, each basically action in debugger has opposite one and life basically go to where you stop. So what it allows you to do instead of just moving forward in one dimension, allow you to move backwards. And this is what makes a big difference. If you're doing debugging then you basically determine if you stop here you can never go back, back in, in past. With replay engine, you can actually go back and past. And then investigate why actually this happens. And when you have a crash uh, and you stop here, you're not interested to rerun it because you don't even sure it will reproduce. You want to see what happens in the last basically five minutes of your run. And replay engine allow you to do it. It allow you to go back. And this is of course not the real going back and not actually running the program back. It's basically going back like in DVR. So you, 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 you save all executions, all messages, everything is saved and you just go back. Just look your recording. It's like having a recording in your car. So you basically driving, have a crash. So you want to prove that you're not guilty. So you just go VCR and just show everything. So this is similar concept basically. You can want to see the last five minutes. And you can, you can go further, basically, you can go to the beginning of your program, but uh, as you can probably try to think that I try to fool you that it's not possible to store everything you run for 10 hours, it will be overflowed of your big supercomputer. Yes, of course, everything you, you cannot store, but we have circular buffer, which means that you can set up the amount of memory you actually want to store. And this is very complicated technology. It's not basically storing huge amount of data. The amount of data it needs to store is quite compressed, very compressed. And uh, I must say, I must say also, it's not completely our own technology. So the basic engine is collaboration with a company in England. So we basically collaborate. They create engine and we create all interface and a lot of. So we, it's co collaboration between two two companies, and it's actually possible. So. I'll show you example. Uh, so this is basically, I will show you example of this execution when you have some bug and you want to find it. And it's basically a repetition of what I said. It's capture execution input and record everything which happens in your program. Uh, and we only support right now on Linux x86-64, but I think we can also support it on ARM. It doesn't depend on us, it depends on our collaborator mostly. So as soon as we have engine for ARM, it will just work. So let me, let me show you some example.
I will show it serial on, on this machine, but you can, we can we support it also MPI. Uh, so I don't have example here, but. Oh, this, this is new UI actually, what it was talking about, dark, dark side. <laughs> uh, okay, so you see there is replay engine tab and I can enable it, just clicking record button and then just hit go button. Okay, nice. So you see there is a crash and there is nothing here, which is quite typical for some bugs. And you, usually how you debug this, you you kill the program, you set a breakpoint and just step, step, step until you have a crash. Uh, but now you're like you have your recording. So what you do, you do unstep. Once you do unstep, you see you, you see more and more information. You have call stack, you have variables. So something really going on here. So you can set a breakpoint and just, just run it here go back let's see so something happened inside this loop so let me investigate what happens so i hover over variables and see array length is 100 okay what is my what is my basically array here it's integer of 20s so it's obviously overrun of buffers of of uh, a bounce of array so i try to run so to write something outside array mm -hmm. And we actually create this demo to demonstrate our favorite memory, memory debugger features. But suddenly we found out that it's not only crash memory, it crash everything. Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering, uh, can you mix both modes and go forward and backwards? Sorry? Can you mix both modes and go forward and backwards? Oh, yeah, definitely. So, for example, now you find this, you change the variable, go forward again, find uh, it, you no. still have the back, and then go back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be really nice to go to past, change something, and go to future. I would be a millionaire and won't be spending time here. <laughs> no, this is recording, remember. You cannot change your past. But you can move back and forwards inside your past. Okay, from what you have already recorded. Yeah, from what you already recorded. Yeah. Could you make that code larger? Larger? One size. Uh, yes, I can, but I don't know how. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, let, let me make it e easier to read, okay? I will make it light scheme. So the change is very simple. The change to light. and just restart. Yeah, on some screens it's better different ones. So again, I just hit recording, set go, and do unstep. Is it better? Yeah, I'm pretty sure I can increase the font. I just using it inside VM machine and it's it's kind of restricted by number of pixels. But you can increase fonts, yes, inside debugger. Okay, so let me continue here and again I see I'm writing outside of bounds. So what I found already my bug, so I want to fix it. So how, what would be the easiest one to fix it? I know for sure that basically array length shouldn't be 100. It should be, I set up it correctly in the beginning of my program. So something in the program, I have data corruption. So I want to see where. The easiest way is to set a watch point.
So I set a watch point here on array lens uh, and set a breakpoint and I just let it run. So it stopped again in function conveniently called bad stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so I see I change array lens some and change it to bigger one, but then I use it assuming it's still 20, but now it's 100. So you can see I fix my bug in basically in one minute. So, and this is of course like simple case, but I know a lot of people and myself included, uh, you can find your bugs in the order of magnitude easier with replay engine. Because once you, you change your mindset that you need, like if you start debugging, your mindset is, okay, I run, restart, set breakpoint, go forward, restart, go forward. In the reverse engine, you basically run backwards and you're only looking for something which happens like immediately before your program. Uh, this is the easiest example when you change something. Uh, the most common example from my experience is using replay engine helps when you have for loop and or you have a function call and it called hundreds of thousands of times and nothing bad happens and everything looks fine. You can set a breakpoint inside your function and you can stop hundreds of times and see nothing wrong. And then finally at some point something bad happens and you want to see this last point of execution. And if you go backwards, you just immediately hit it. It's your first hit of your breakpoint. Something bad happens there. And so example, for example, an example would be processing data. You read data from your file, call function, process it. Again, read, process it. If data is correct, everything fine. If you have a bad data, then something bad happens. If you go backwards, you see this is the latest bit of your data. So that's why reverse engine basically is, it's how like most of our developers operate right now. So we switch to Linux from AIX immediately because we only support it of x86. Okay, and once I'm here, last point, preferences. Uh, you can switch to classic interface here as well. Uh, and this is new user interface. And the slightest problems that I, I will probably mention later on as well. On some machines, and this is unfortunately true for Argo and Theta, uh, new interface doesn't work in our uh, remote display client. So sometimes you're forced to use old interface, but basically it will be also pretty straightforward. Uh, so let's, let me move back to presentation. And slide four. Okay, so we talk about re, uh, reverse engine. So next one, I will talk about memory debugging. Uh, so memory debugging uh, is also a big part of TotalView and uh, we actually developed this technology uh, following requests from users. So memory debugging was always uh, possible using Purify and special tools which was separately available. Uh, the problem with specialized to uh, memory tools was you cannot stop your execution and do memory debugging. You only see it afterwards. So you see like ton of log files and you need to parse them all and see what's going on. And the user came to us and said, so why don't we just stop it and see it? And this is how memory escape was born, which now bundled with TotalU. So this is only heap, uh, heap analyzer. So we, we, we can see everything on the heap and we can find uh, all memory leaks and memory events on the, basically on the fly. And we can detect all uh, API misuse uh, dangling pointers, buffer, buffer overflow, and again, there's different uh, stages. There's simple one, more advanced, and like I think there's four stages when you select which memory problems you want to find, and then memory escape will will find them. Uh, so we don't use anything uh, external uh, libraries. Everything is optimized for our debugger. We wrote all, all memory debugging for for us. 
and we have control of it. So uh, if, if you do an MPI debugging, so the strategy here would be to run across your whole MPI and you can compare memory usage. And this is very fast operation for us. Uh, once you find a uh, process which consume uh, different memory, you can compare it to, uh, to correct one or you can just investigate one of it. So memory scape allow you to do two things. First, it allow you from the top level to see the whole memory usage and memory executions for all your MPI. And then you can dip down to the individual blocks of memory. So you can go to individual block and see what memory was written here. You can see whether it's overwritten by, by for example, you can put guard, guard blocks in front and afterwards. And you can see whether it was boundary overrides. Uh, you can see whether uh, there was dangling pointers, like I said. And uh, you can also filter out what you want to see, what libraries you want to debug with memory debugging. And this is also important if you're doing a lot of system packages and you add in your own module and you only want to debug your own module. So you can set up debugging on your module. Uh, I'm a little short on time, so I don't want to spend a lot of time on memory debugging, so I'll just move further. But uh, there is a, a lot of documentation on our site how to do memory debugging. And uh, I'm pretty sure there is a lot of webinars you can go and see on our website. Or if you're working on some university with total view, there should be some, some information there. And we, we do special tutorials also on memory debugging on total view. So in the next part of presentation, I will be talking about GPU debugging and Python debugging and show some demos as well. So we are started with GPU debugging working with NVIDIA uh, for a number of years ago, basically from the beginning of uh, CUDA. And this is one of our, not the first one, but one of the latest one, Jetson TX1 support. And now we support uh, different Jetsons and uh, give you multiple platforms, Linux x86-64, PowerLE, and ARM64, so we can debug <coughs> uh, GPUs on ARM64 uh, features. Uh, we support all features basically for CUDA, and also we support CUDA core debugging. Uh, and the main thing that I want probably, I don't want to go through all of this, uh, just to want to give you the main idea. So you can do debugging on GPU the same way, way like you do on CPU with totally. And we basically introduce uh, unified source debugging. So uh, you can have the same session and in the same session you can debug CPU and GPU. And let me show you example of that. So in this case, uh, I was experimenting, so I'll have a video. So I don't want to embarrass myself and <laughs> try to get something stupid. So let me embarrass myself in a different way. I try to speak as fast as I, as video goes. Okay, so this is new user interface. And I didn't mention, but if you have a recent session, you can load it as well. But there is also s links to, uh, to website uh, and we put like all new information about uh, latest version, what was, what was new. And if you want to load session, you can browse here and find the program. Or I don't want to do it here because I already did it once. I have recent session, TX CUDA MetMAL with a date. I just click and load the whole session with all my breakpoints and all my data. I don't know why it's so bad quality, usually it's better. Okay, so I can set a breakpoint inside CPU, but also inside GPU before even loading the kernel. So, and this different type of breakpoint shows there is no data yet. But once I have data, I will set breakpoint as close to my point as possible. And once I start uh, debugging, I can, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, sorry for the quality. I don't know why it's so so bad. Uh, 
and I can see variables inside CPU and drag them to my data view. Uh, and then I can hit go. Uh, and then it will run to the next breakpoint, which will be in GPU. So I don't need to have two debuggers. I only need to have one. And one is hit here in the same session. And you see there is two more, uh, basically, kind of tabs with uh, GPU warps and lanes. So now I can change between warps and lanes, physical, and also between logical. And I can have a data and move it to the same data window. And if I move data from CPU to GPU, I can compare them in the same window. So this is all. And if I have two GPUs, I think I can switch between GPUs as well. And everything here is the same as CPU. So I just show you can see them side by side, but all functionality is basically the same. So it's the same debugging on GPU and CPU. And in call stack, I can switch between uh, different stack frames and see variables on warps and lanes. Okay, let me probably stop it here. Okay, how many of you are interested in GPU? Okay, good. So you can, you can basically start a debugging on GPU and it will, it will show you exactly the same like on CPU. And for GPU, like, like I said, let me just go back to slide since I don't know why. See, at least I promise you I embarrass myself on, on demo. So on GPU we support, again, uh, logical coordinates grid blocks and physical coordinates. So you can switch between different lanes, warps, or you can just go to blocks and switch between different coordinates and you can see data in all of them. You can stop inside GPU, of course, and you can see data and then continue. Set up breakpoints. So everything which is, almost everything which is available in CPU is also available in GPU. Okay, so let me continue with slide. Next one. Uh, next big area we are now focusing right now is Python and C++. Yeah. Uh, do you have any like sub warp level debugging? Like, can you tell if your if your uh, like your threads are diverging or if you have like a thread sitting idle? Uh, yes, we can do that, and this we can do from device window. We have a device window, and I can show you after that. Uh, in this device window, we show you the state of your execution program. So we show, we show each lane PC and each lane status, whether it's active, divergent, or whatever. Okay, so debugging multiple languages can be difficult. And the main difficulties is you need to transfer your data from one language to another. And you also, especially with Python, there's a lot of glue code that is created when you call C, C++ functions. And issues basically a lot of different extra stack frames, type mismatches, and it's just usually two debuggers. And sometimes you don't have a debugger at all. Uh, so what we provide with Python, and this will only go to new UI for now, uh, we fully integrated Python C++ call stack, and we glue layers between the languages and they removed. What we don't provide yet, certain breakpoints. So let me try to show you another example and probably video. So this is, programs that I will try to demonstrate. And so this is a main here, and it calls another subroutine in Fortran called FACT. It will import a uh, Python example, uh, which will be called function uh, FACT, and this will be in C. So it will import C module and then call function inside C code.
Okay, so if you want to debug it with total you, all you need to do is call total you and there's arcs Python and you need to have debug version of Python and then your test program. So debugging on Python is a little difficult uh, because not all compilers and not all distributions support debugging. Uh, right now we support 2.7 and 3 and we support many distribution, but there is some distribution which we just don't support. For example, latest Anaconda, I think, is not uh, supported because they don't have any debug information, so they don't supply it. So you, if you want to debug Fortran, you and you don't see debug information from distribution, you basically need to build it yourself, install it on your system, and then debug it. Because we need debug information. Compilers produce debug information, debuggers use it. If compilers doesn't produce it, there is nothing we can do. So in this case, I use 2.7, but you can use 3. And let me see. I just yeah, type and hit run. And that will open your uh, user interface again. And uh, I see I loaded Python 2.7 debug version right now, and this is what I'm going to debug. And I need to set a breakpoint first so that I can stop inside my C, C++ code, because remember, I cannot still, yet I, we cannot step on uh, Python code. So I set a breakpoint inside my fact, which is pending breakpoint, because it will be hit. And then hit run and end up in my uh, C code. So let me stop here for a second if I can. So this is what happens if you don't have debug uh, support for debugger. Uh, for, for, uh, let me see if I can stop it. Okay, let me explain it here very first what I did. So I create a breakpoint inside my C function and then just hit it run. And once it hit this breakpoint, So let me start from the beginning. Okay. So this is my Python code. I will set a breakpoint and then I will stop and explain. Okay, so I try to stop here, but basically what I will show you, if you don't have a debugging support, you only have C function, which is all glue code. So in this glue code, there is no useful information because it's all optimized. It's a sweep. In this case, I think it's sweep. Uh, if you inside a C function and you enable uh, Python support, then you see there is Python code and there is C code. Inside Python code, I have a variables that I can basically drag and compare. And also inside uh, C code, inside Python and C code, they're intermixed. So it will show me directly which frame is called what. And there is no glue code here. There is only the stuff that I need. And debugger reconstruct Python frames and Python variables. 
and show you uh, how they modified if you move from one to another. In this example, if you see, probably not very good, there is variable n, which is moved from Python to C, and it changes basically how much memory is allocated. So the same value, but it changed the type from 64 to 32. And sometimes it help you to find some obscure bugs while it's working or not. And also inside, once you, once you finish, you can save your action points and next time you don't need to set it up. So in this case, you need to, I, I, I cannot set it in my system way, so I save it as a different file in my home directory. And once I load it, let me first save it, breakpoints, I can exit and load my breakpoint again. And what I try to basically tell here is that you only need to set up breakpoint once and all your session is saved again. So next time you start, you just hit, you just load your breakpoints and all breakpoints is saved and you can continue debugging your Python. So you only need to set it up at once. And if you're doing debugging Python and C, C++, uh, let me show you in the slide. I was pretty sure. Just what you saw. So if you have no support, you still can debug your C application. But all you see is glue code with different function and no function data and no. Uh, if you enable Python debugging and debugger allow you to do, you show you Python, C, C++ frames and also data which you can compare. Okay, so, so any question about Python? I was a little going probably quickly. Yeah. So does, this works with uh, Swig in your case? Yes. This particular Swig, but we support more than one. We support Py, PyBind and I think another one as well. Okay. So <clears throat> this is all nice, but how can you work on your uh, computer centers? And there is another product which we have, which is called Remote Display Debugging. And this is basically clients that you can install on your laptop. And actually you can install it on Windows. So this is the only product actually we have for Windows. Uh, it runs on your local machine and allow you to connect to your, to your supercomputer center and manage all connections. Uh, this is based on open source uh, VNC technology. So you don't need to use it if you have VNC, but if you can use everything, everything you want, but if you find out that SSH-X is pretty slow for using graphical tools. Uh, then you can use either VNC or just remote display client, which is bundled with totally. So it looks like that. Uh, and this is on Windows. All you need to do, you need to set remote host, your username or how you want to connect. Uh, you can select host how you get to your like firewalls, you can set up here different paths and you can sell the comment, for example, module load total you should work if you have totally installed. And you can set different sessions for different machines. <coughs> you can also, all you need is a pass to total you. So if you don't have module load, you can just put the total name and then you launch debug session, uh, which will connect you to Okay, so let me show a quick demo and then go to summary. So this is remote display client installed on my machine, Windows. And I have advanced options module load total you. And I load I can load a different one basically. This is model load. You can submit a job, but it's maybe not as useful.
Yeah, sometimes you ask it twice, but let me type my password. Let me set it up before handouts. Okay, let me go to the first summary. So, use of modern debuggers save you time, and uh, what totally the screen and modern debugger allows you to do. If you compare, for example, with printf. It allow you to do cross-platform, so this basically you don't need to, to learn each tools on each platform. Uh, allow you to debug accelerator and allows you to debug multiple languages. So now quickly how to use Total U on Argon and on any other center. You basically have classic method, you can type Total U, the RARCs, MPI, exec, or AP run, or you can load parallel session and, and run it. And on Argon, total use available on Theta, Vesta, Miraculi, I guess. And it is installed in soft debuggers. You just need to mod module load total U. And if your connection is slow and you don't want to, to set up VNC yourself, you can use our RDC. I put a copy in project uh, area so you can just install it on your laptop if you want uh, or you can download it from our website it's it's actually free you don't need to buy total you to download a remote display client it's bundled as a free add-on uh, you connect uh, get allocation module load and just if you use rdc use dash old ui new ui doesn't communicate very well with rdc if you're using any other tools you can use both interfaces Okay, uh, documentation, you can see documentation on our website and there's a lot of tutorials and videos and there's a very nice Python debugging blog that you can use. <coughs> okay, any questions? And you also can send me email and we'll be happy to answer. I have a couple of questions. Um, one is, what if you're calling a Fortran library from C? How's that handled? Uh, it, you won't see a difference. You just see like F Fortran's frame when you go inside Fortran, but uh, you can mix any combination. Okay. We support that from the beginning, basically. Uh, we first start supporting Fortran and then we start adding C, and so now it's all intermixed. Um, um, I saw that you had uh, open ACC listed. Did you guys have plans for any other kind of for uh, heterogeneous computing? Did you have plans for any other pair of companies? Uh, uh, which one you're talking about? We support open ACC, we also support open MP. Okay. And uh, with Python support, uh, we have this uh, facility called uh, Stack Transformation, which is basically the, the main way to filter out glue code. So that's why we have much more flexibility to support different paradigms. Yeah. For also a very nice features, for the GPU in kernel debugging, do you require like Pascal GPUs on your or? Uh, no, we support all GPUs. So we support, uh, uh, the latest one we tested was Turing. So we support Turing, Volta, Pascal, everything before that. And we also support uh, GPU like Jetson. Jetson, I, I can say Jetson Nano because we didn't test it yet, but Jetson, yes, we support. Okay. 
Does the GPU debugger only support NVIDIA GPUs currently? Uh, right now, on, on, on the card, yes. I made some experiment on AMD OpenCL, uh, but this is basically emulator type, so it's all on CPU. Uh, but in future, yes, we will support uh, different ones, like AMD and maybe Intel. Okay, any more questions? Intel. <laughs> oh, yeah, Intel. Intel. Okay, thank you very much. Okay.